Canadian investors are using ZSP over any other ETF for exposure to the S&P 500 index. Institutional investors, investment advisors, and DIY investors have all been trusting ZSP with their investment dollars since the fall of 2012. ETFs provide instant access to a portfolio of stocks to investors in a single cost-efficient trade. For an investor to own the entire index would require institutional level trading systems and expertise. To accomplish this, an investor would have to buy 500 stocks at a time, and then as the market moves, it would constantly have to rebalance with 500 stocks several times a year. ZSP simplifies this process by aiming to provide instant access to the 500 stocks in the index in a very easy and low cost way. Before we get started, I just want to remind everyone that this information discussed today is not intended to be or construed as investment advice. Please consult a professional advisor before putting a loony in any of these financial markets. The dirty secret is that no one's ever going to get paid back the shortest memories when it comes to investment. We just gotta get Keith into Bitcoin. Hey, there's a bubble. Welcome back to Looney Hour, episode 136. As always, join me the three amigos, Keith Dicker, Ice Cap Asset Management, Rich Diaz, PGM Global. Gentlemen, what's going on? Keith, you still got a had a Gucci vest on. It's mid-May. I I know it's getting closer and closer to summer here, and uh, but guys, I told you this is the love week. This is the love weekend for me, Mrs. Ice Cap. Oh this boy, our, yeah, it's our twenty fifth anniversary this weekend. Wow, so we're, yeah, wow. we're going to go away down down in the south. Summer coast. of love. Yeah, the, <laughs> the weekend of love, maybe. <laughs> no, but we're going away for a few days on the south coast of Nova Scotia. We're looking mm -hmm. forward to it, and uh, it, it'll be fun. Where's that? So Cole Harbor. Almost mm. Sidney Crosby. Get a load of this guy. This guy from Vancouver. Everything revolves around Sidney Crosby. You ever seen no. him? Uh, no, I, I've never bumped into. Uh, you don't know him over here, but he's from Nova Scotia. There's only like a hundred yeah, people no. there. No. <laughs> yeah. Every everyone says, "Oh yeah, I know Sidney stuff." I don't know him. I, I've never met him, but uh, I've met a lot of people who know him. <laughs> What about you, Rich? Who do you know there in, in Montreal these days? Oh, hey, I don't know anybody. Hey, just you um, and a couple of people. Nick Suzuki? <laughs> I do not know. I would love to meet Nick Suzuki. I'm not a fanboy for anybody except uh, maybe Coffee. Jay Powell and definitely some Montreal Canadiens hockey players. But my big news and is Carolyn Rogers. And definitely Carolyn Rogers, for sure. My big news is that I had a National Geographic moment this morning. I woke up early and was having my coffee and doing some work. And I looked out the window and I saw a fox with her three baby foxes. I'm sure there's a real name for that. But yeah, her tiny little pups. They were so cute. They were tiny. They're like, and, they, and what's fascinating is the, the fox is like bright, bright orange. And her little pups were like very dark gray, which I thought was cool. And so I have a pair of binoculars just as you do. If you're weird like me, oh, and, and the, oh, I, the neighborhood, I hope you call the uh, animal control. <laughs> no, no, come on! They're, it was come get so them. cute. They're so beautiful, and so they were and just I, playing around. I don't think it's foxes. I think plural is fox eye, isn't it? But yeah, foxy. maybe, maybe. Uh, foxies. <laughs> Anyways, there you go. That's my story for today. I saw three fox eye out in the playing around. They're very cute, and no, I did not call animal control. And you're the guy walking around the city with binoculars around your neck no. all the time. <laughs> Rich, fanny that's pack. the number oh, one. The fanny pack. <laughs> yeah. Now we know the answer to the next question. Any yeah. dates last week? No, no, no. How's the binoculars, man? Uh, the, the binoculars are good. <laughs> How about you, Steve? What's going on on your side? It's good. Quite the intro. Uh, yeah, just uh, you guys. Anyone that watched last week's episode was wondering where I was, where my background was. I was actually at the hospital there. I uh, just had our first baby girl so uh congratulations to steve and his family we uh you know last week when we were recording the episode with uh with grant like any we're expecting steve any minute to say i gotta go <laughs> yeah the wife did give me for all those listeners that are concerned the wife gave me the blessings to do the podcast i was a fanboy of grant williams for quite some time wanted to do that pod and i think she gave birth about an hour and a half after the pod. So well done. We were we were kind of a bit close, but um, yeah, no, everyone's happy, healthy, and it's been good. New yep. chapter. Ba ba uh, Steve's newborn is named Grant, by the way. <laughs> <Yeah>. Grantel. <laughs> 
Oh, wow. Right, That's well, exciting. Looney Hour news, everyone, today. And Looney Hour, I, the Looney Hour family got one one larger. One bigger. So there and we I go. guess that's I guess that's a good place to end it. Thanks everyone <laughs> for following. <laughs> so uh well let's 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 dive into it this week. It's kind of it feels like we're kind of getting into the like early start to the summer. It's kinda of, kinda of quiet out there, not gonna lie. But um you know, on the housing on the housing front, I don't know, I don't know if we talked about it last week, but on the uh some of the Bank of Canada numbers that came out showing the mortgage renewals. Obviously, 2026 being the big year. Um, so, you know, we'll see about a 30% increase in people's mortgage payments come 2026. Um, but our good friend of the show, Ben Rabido, had a good chart out this morning showing that uh, he's calling it an, uh, an already historic housing downturn in Canada, where we have some metros that have already seen a 30% uh, house price correction from February 2022 peak levels. Uh, in real terms, right? So in real terms, adjusted for inflation, um, Canada home prices are down more than 20% from the peak. Um, you've got places like London, Ontario, down over 30%, Kitchener, 30%, uh, Hamilton, getting very, very close to 30%. And like pretty much the only outlier of that so far is is Calgary, which is up uh, about 5% or so in real terms. So it's been it's pretty pretty interesting. I guess you know there's not really a, a true national housing market, but you can see that some of these major metros that had a ton of speculation, ton of froth, have have been taken out to the woodshed. Question: um, Do you think any of these? I know this is a very it's impossible it's impossible question to ask, but I'm gonna ask it anyway. Do you think any of these um, major metros have like significant portion of people in negative equity? Oh, for sure. Like you might have had in Las Vegas. Remember the, <laughs> it's a gully. But no, that was like part of the problem with the US example is that people were massively negative equity. And despite being recourse or non recourse loans, people still walked away from their properties. And my question for you is do you, is there other people in these metros that have negative equity? Is it to the same degree? Are they 40% underwater? Maybe they're just, there's their equity is zero. Does that no, make sense? I mean, I think like the housing market in, in Canada and in these metros has moved so much in the last 10 years. Like it's unbelievable. Yeah. You know, if you bought at the peak in 2022, like you might be sitting on that house for 10 years, you know, okay. like you you could be in a negative equity position or, you know, um, sitting on a, a situation. And I, you know, I'm seeing this in Vancouver. There's people that bought in, you know, 2022, or sometimes it peaks of the market, depending on the segment, you know, bought in 2018, they're trying to go to resell. And it's like, well, Hey, listen, you know, you paid $900,000, but I can only get you 875. And, you know, then you tack on, you know, realtor fees, lawyer fees, transfer tax fees, and, you know, you you could be looking at a $100,000 loss after, you know, six years of holding a property. So, you know, I think it's yeah, it's definitely not like widespread. There's just because of the price growth over the last decade has been so large. But there's definitely people that are going to be stuck in housing or in particular houses for, yeah, it could be like a lost decade, let's call it. You know, what's, what's interesting over here, you know, you, you just mentioned some of Ben's, uh, Ben Rabbit's comments on markets that he's looking at um, here locally. We have an article this morning that came out um, and it's talking about the construction boom here in, in the city. And it's still booming. You drive around here in Halifax and there's building after building after building going up, which is extremely positive because, you know, you know, we need more units coming online. So even if there's no new construction coming online here, I think here locally, we'll have a lot of the, excess demand or a lack of supply will get closer to equilibrium here pretty soon. But this article this morning was just commenting that how all these other markets are struggling right now. Like, like it mentions London specifically, uh, Toronto, Montreal, Vancouver and stuff. But here in Halifax, uh, I know that the numbers are booming. So Steve, you might want to get a, a multi-provincial licensing registration. <laughs> and I'm moving up. over. You got room in your basement? <laughs> we always got room for you. Is it uh, is that market over there? Is it is it still going pretty strong? You walk down the street, you see a lot of for sale signs or what? No, a lot of, I, a lot I, of motivated I, people around here. Yeah, there are. Uh, no, I don't think there are many motivated people. Truthfully, um, I'm not in that space. And any realtors in Halifax can reach out and share with us. But from what I see visually, I don't think there's a lot of listings out there. Um, 
you know, especially high quality ones. It depends on your definition of quality, of course. Yeah. But there's not a lot out there. And as soon as they come on, they are they are snapped up. I mean, that is happening. Uh, the other big story here from a real estate perspective, you know, like everywhere else, you know, we have this housing accelerator fund. The housing strategy. decelerator. <laughs> yeah. It, it has uh, a lot of people are really worked up over it here in our community uh, because it, it could potentially take a single family home and turn it into, I think, eight units, I think it can do on a pretty small footprint. Uh, so in the neighborhood that I'm in, you know, which is a high exclusive gated neighborhood. Gate is you, you go know. out there your pitch for your uh your sign <laughs> not in my uh, backyard nimby nimby yeah we don't want that stuff but uh yeah there are a lot of neighborhoods out there that are upset about it and uh you know and i don't i'm not seeing any results of it yet in terms of you know houses being sold and developers coming in but you're hearing some anecdotal stories how uh like just recently it's not too far from where i am that uh house on the market you know an older couple they had to move on to a home or something and the house on the market and apparently a developer was going to scoop in and the next door neighbors had to come in and buy it because they don't want the they're so move. rich they can buy their neighbor's house to keep someone else from building on it well it is health it's not toronto or oh, gta it's not, it's not shaughnessy you know or you know kids Lando. some boomer that bought their house for five grand and a bucket of raspberries <laughs> yeah that's right <laughs> but that is happening here so i mean we you know real estate is you know regional of course and but from an aggregate level you know you're always going to have the economy you know, the income that's available and financing cost but down here locally, again, one thing I do like, I do see uh, a solution, you know, to the lack of inventory. Because again, you know, we've gone from being a, a little city with probably five big story buildings, maybe, <laughs> and now now there's a ton of them coming on. So whether you like it or you don't, but the fact is, there's there's lots of units coming on. Speaking of this that, uh, speaking of that densification, there, um, kind of been following it there's a there was a sort of a controversy that was brewing in calgary so the mayor who's very very unpopular i don't know if you guys saw the yeah it was like, i think it was like the final calgary flames game of the season she came out to do the puck drop and the fans just the fans just started booing uh like <laughs> they very, let her have loudly. it man yeah <laughs> yeah it did, not, did not go well anyway she's not she's not very popular but uh what what has i don't know the story at all like give me an example of why um i'll just put it this way i think politically she leans to the left and i think calgary in general tends to lean to the right um she's left but get her get her let's just no, put but it no, that but way you know what? they deserve pretty... what they they don't the voter turnout was like 30 percent for the mayoral mayor, mayoral election oh, i can't say that word yeah it was, you know it, was, was... it was bad so anyway she's some anyway she somehow sorry. snuck in and she's uh <laughs> I don't know. Let's put it. She's very progressive. Let's put it that way. Uh, vote so, people get out and vote. Sorry. Keep going. She's not very popular. So there was this big um, <clears throat> policy they've been trying to push through that kind of comes in coincides with the housing uh, accelerator fund, which is basically Calgary is trying to pass this zoning um, to allow basically row houses and townhouses essentially on every single family lot. So, you know, again, you can still build single family in the inner city, totally fine, but you can't discriminate and not allow row house or townhouse and so it's been like just seeing all the news articles over the last like three four months it's been like very contentious and uh anyways they've just voted the other day and they passed it so calgary by right of way now allows um i think up to up to eight units on like a standard lot that's Which, exactly like, standard lot of, yeah. yeah that's what we have here as, as well steve and um Anyway, so it's a four it's like go eight, with it i mean this so is, the lots I mean, there are bigger right they're like 50 feet to, like a lot of the times they'll be 50 feet by let's say 120 so six thousand square foot lot um and so what you can do is you can do the zoning i think is called rcg and so it's like four it's like four units up like like a little like almost like a, like it looks like a fourplex or like four row houses and then they have all all of them have four legal basement suites underneath them so those are the additional four units so then you get basically you get eight doors essentially um now again are, is everyone going to build those no it's hard to sort of jam eight units on a on an inner city 
inside law. But anyways, long story short, I think that's just where the zoning is going. You know, BC has enacted this. They were kind of the first. Calgary's now followed. Keith, you're talking about Halifax. Um, this is this is kind of where where the the puck is going, so to speak. I like how you keep in the hockey theme. That that's a really good storytelling. Like that? uh, yeah, that's good. Nice skill set. Yeah, Canucks are looking good, baby. Yeah, because you're playing against an AHL goalie. <laughs> I'm not a Canucks fan, truthfully. They're, they're yeah, my number. I know. They're my number three. Yeah. Well, but who's your number two? I'd probably go Sid the Kid, Pittsburgh Penguins. Okay. Oh, jeez. He's, he's my Harbor, friend. He's, he's, he's my friend. I hang out with him. <laughs> Wait, so I, have, I have a question on this this zoning thing. I, I think blanket anything is usually a terrible idea. And so and naturally, this is what the our dear leader has come up with as, as a way of solving a problem that he created. But in defense of this higher density stuff, I mean, if you if you're in the plateau, if you're in Montreal, some of the best, most vibrant parts of Montreal are like these areas in Montreal where it's like three or four stories like not 20 stories i get that's ungaudy and we don't want to screw with mr dicker's backyard uh, sunning bed but if you go two or three four stories you and then you have let's say two units on each story i mean that's the plateau and the plateau is amazing and you never feel that it's like not a community and you never feel like there's too much housing and you, I, so i i don't know why you know if, if if that was like the worst the case that happened that you have pa- places of of calgary that had a little bit more density i mean that seems like a decent idea, God forbid. Yeah, I mean, I mean, I personally, I'm a fan of of the way, like you know, you build out those cities is kind of more like more density, but like in a low rise fashion. I'm not, right. a, I'm not a huge tower fan. No, uh, me neither. I just think they're not great to live in, and and. But it, it makes sense if you're in Hong Kong or even yeah. Vancouver, dare I say, where there's like literally no surface area. But when you're in Calgary. <laughs> There's a lot of space in Canada. I don't really understand, or even Montreal. I mean, I just don't get it. Uh, but well, I mean, that's I? why like apartment units or condo units in Calgary like don't typically sell very well. It's because okay, people cool. people have options, and when land is like less scarce, people will just kind of drive thirty minutes outside and and get you know a duplex or a townhouse uh, as opposed to buying an inner city condo. And trees and foxes, they have like nature. Fox eye, fox eye, fox eye, fox eye. Fox eye. get it right. <laughs> Anyways, I think that... everyone, but everyone would agree. I mean, the, the challenge with, you know, this rezoning law that's, it's being, seems to be forced on everyone. It's, it seems to be a very aggressive, late reaction, you know, to this <laughs> housing crisis. Like it, it, I don't know. I think maybe you need to put more thought we need to put more thought into it. Yeah, what no, is sure. the right solution? But one blanket policy for everywhere, it, like like you guys just you know confirmed, it doesn't make sense. But that's where we're going. And the other thing I don't understand about this policy, uh, again here locally as well, I read the article like for Calgary and Winnipeg and places. They're getting the cities are getting funding for it from Ottawa, mm-hmm. but what are the cities spending the money? on it seems like what i'm reading in these articles they're using to help streamline the process but why would a municipality need 92 million dollars from ottawa to make it a faster approach like how are they spending that money like where's it coming a lot of it it a lot of it's supposed to go into infrastructure upgrades um so city sewer lines water etc because like obviously you know if you're adding you know, a hundred new houses on one, on one new, on one street. Right. I mean, you got to upgrade all the, uh, all it's the a lot of toilets. It's a lot of toilets flushing. So, and that's been the big issue is the cities have basically been saying, well, we have to upgrade the infrastructure. And so we need to, if someone wants to redevelop a single family house into four units, you know, we need to charge them, uh, an arm and a leg in, in fees, basically uh, infrastructure upgrade fees. And of course, once you, tack those fees onto the development, um, the project either becomes no longer economically viable or, you know, it ultimately just gets passed on to the end user through higher prices. And that's where, you know, we've talked about it on the show, but I mean, the cost of the cost of new construction or new housing in, in places like Vancouver and Toronto, you know, close to 30% of the price is just government taxes and fees. So... <laughs> Kind of comes full circle to the losing hour theme over the last it's, couple of years, which Charlie, is all levels. As Charlie government. Brown would have said, "Good grief!" 
You don't know who Charlie Brown is? Of course you know who Charlie Brown is. <laughs> I know who's your favorite Brown. who's your favorite peanuts character pig pen pig pen by far is the best the one with the flies that constantly circle around yeah yeah that's yeah it's not with like dust and everything around yeah, them, yeah. Eh? That's the best yeah. yeah there's a yeah. lot of there's a lot of conspiracies like out there as well in terms of actually I don't even know if it's conspiracy to be honest I mean it's kind of out there in public but a lot of the encouraging the the densification of sort of inner city metropolitans right like urban centers uh rich is yeah is kind of geared towards climate change and you know having people not commute 45 minutes into the city so they want to sort of densify these areas and have you know I mean, they call what do they call it the 15 minute city yeah right which is like you know even if you're in like a, a tier two city or like you know like a, a suburb just outside of the the big city you know that your little suburb has your shopping mall your grocery store yeah, it's got you know. So it's um, I think a lot of that is is that push being behind that too is. And how does that change the weather? I don't know. How does it work? How dare you question the wisdom of our dear leader? <laughs> I think there's been is you know I think it's a good way. To, there was a couple of stories this week that it, as Sleepy soon Joe. as they came out, uh, yeah, I was very early. I, I sent you guys radio. I said, huh? I thought he wanted you know oh yeah well that's a big boss. deal though we gotta talk, tell people what that what that is okay i'll tee it up but i'm gonna you know butcher it of course and then steve you can come in and really clean it up but a few days ago um the white house administration they announced you know the, these new uh taxes or you know another tariffs. word for taxes a tariff it's the same thing right but it's it's another <laughs> tariff but on chinese imports related to um what was that specifically? What what products? Um, oh, EVs, solar yeah. panels. Um, there's semiconductor stuff in there. Yeah, all this stuff, you know, mostly related to clean energy. That that's what it's focused on. And I read as soon as I read this, I'm like, wait a second. I thought this was the administration that's gone all in on trying to to support you know the climate change uh, global initiative. And here they are. They're penalizing a country that is going to import to you lower cost products that will help you achieve your very objective. Yeah, no, let's- Does that make for, sense? Yeah, yeah. Let's, un, let's unpack that a bit further. So this is from uh, Javier Blay with, uh, he's the energy and commodities columnist at Bloomberg. Uh, so he notes that the White House announced new anti-China tariffs. So electric vehicles, uh, the tariff on that will be, will go from 25% to 100%. So 100% <laughs> tariff on EVs uh, manufactured in China. Uh, EV batteries from 7.5%, they're being ratcheted up to a 25% tariff. Uh, solar cells going from 25% to 50%. And then uh, steel and aluminum from um, basically 7.5% to 25%. So basically they've said the green energy transition uh will not be manufactured by China. They're going to try to do it all in house, which of course Rich, I mean I'll let you unpack that, but that sounds very costly and it seems the biggest hurdle today from a user adoption perspective is the cost. Yeah. You know, like people aren't buying evs today i mean you know you're seeing ev sales obviously falter because the cost it's just it's not economical it's cheaper for more people just to buy gas powered cars yeah i mean there's lots there's a bunch of stuff we got packed there i think just really quickly three things one uh ev uh china's starting to dominate the ev market for better and for worse for better is they're producing cars at a quicker rate and at a cheaper rate and people like them uh, that's what that's the dirty little secret. People actually think that a lot of these start BYD. If you look at their um, share price, it's doing really well. Um, people enjoy the cars. The, the adoption is doing really well in China. Remember, Who's China's first? a <laughs> remember China's a net importer of crude oil and fossil fuels. They consume about a 15 million barrels of oil a day. They produce only about five. So they have a huge crude oil deficit and energy deficit full stop, but especially crude oil deficit. And so for them, EVs totally make sense. They burn an incredible amount of coal <laughs> and they can transform that coal, which they're building many, many, many new power plants. They can transform that coal energy, which is really cheap, 
and readily available in, to power their, uh, their, their cars and their fleet of cars. So that's their strategy there. I think that it touched on one more thing, which is um, the America first strategy that was adopted under Trump. And again, not to be political, but that is definitely economic ramifications we're seeing. The America First strategy started sort of under Trump to me is just a, 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 an ethos, an ethic, a, a way of viewing the world is ca- being carried on by Joe Biden to me lockstep. So the first there was the IRA, which is the Inflation Reduction Act, which is not at all, which is the biggest misnomer I think ever. But that was um, not only was that mega, mega infrastructure spending, which I think is a good thing, but also loads of sort of... Um, basically restricting sort of imports and whatever, trying to build up domestic industry as a as sort of a response to China, in response to other countries. Which, by the way, the Europeans hate the IRA and trying to very slowly come up with their response to that. But then there was also the CHIPS Act, um, which was to sort of, as a stupid example, to fund the building of chip manufacturers in Arizona. And this is an enormous amount of money that they're piling into this to sort of, again, to be not so... Um, at the risk of the Taiwan chip manufacturing sector, et cetera, et cetera. And so the e- the tariffs on the EV to me was just a natural next step. As China gets better and better at producing EVs and is trying to sort of flood the market in, in Europe and in the US, you could argue they're dumping, but that's a different conversation. The US naturally pushed back. So, and then the final piece, Keith, you'll love this, which is how does this help with climate change or emissions or whatever? I'll let you <laughs> tell us and figure out how that works. But that these are this is like you know many t- many months ago we talked about the Cold War II, the bifurcation of the global trade. I think it's going to happen slowly. I don't think it's going to happen nearly as fast as people think it is. But this is just sort of another step in that direction, and it's just a, an interesting one. Yeah. What so about I, I think, uh, yes. I think somewhere in there you you said that didn't this didn't quite make sense if you were truly into fighting climate change. That doesn't make sense. And then we have the Canadian equivalent that just happened up here as well. I'll just quickly blurt that one out, and then you guys can talk about it a lot more, you know, particularly than I can. But the uh, didn't this week the Canadian government announce they won, I don't know, somebody else decided they're going to come to Canada to produce EV batteries? Yeah, Honda. Honda. Yeah. And the reason they weren't considering Canada at first, but somehow we went from like ninth on the list to number one. Do you remember why? Yeah. <laughs> what do they get? 15 billion? Oh, yeah. It's a pocket load of money. So let's let's examine that one real quick and because it does still tie in with the American. But hold story. on. That, that lady, the, the press conference is an important step. I don't know. I think she was working with Honda. I don't know. But anyway, this Japanese lady. I believe she was with Honda. She literally said verbatim, <laughs> Canada was number three on our list. She's a translator. She was a translator because Honda is a Japanese company for people who may not know. And there was a translator and she was... <laughs> Maybe there was something lost in translation, but she literally said... No, Canada that's was... the joke. The joke is she perfectly translated what the Japanese executive said. That's why... Sorry, keep going. Anyways, she basically <laughs> said uh, that Canada was third on the list, but essentially uh, we got a huge check and uh, here we are. Like It's just... My God, right? Can... The level of... The amount of uh, the tone deafness scale or whatever you want to call it out of Ottawa. So in their mind are thinking, hey, we got to win. We got another you know, create so many jobs here and stuff like that. So first of all, if, if they really are focused on, you know, policies to improve climate change, right? Um, if the whole world is online with doing that, it should, those projects and tasks and responsibilities, it should be allocated to the lowest cost producer, period. Because it's for the good of the earth. It doesn't matter who's producing it or who's going to do it. So for Ottawa to step in and spend, and do you say it was an extra fifteen billion? Is that what you said? So one, I believe one it five? was fifteen billion. Don't yeah, that's me on right. That. Okay, so fifteen billion dollars. Think about that for anyone here who's you know uh, involved with municipal politics or at the provincial side or even any any departments out of Ottawa. Think of what 15 billion could do for us here as a nation. My God, our, our deficit is going to be 40 billion. Right? That's 15. We, all, we get you know, well, it's, it's like not in one year. To be to be fair, it's not 15 bucks, 15 billion in one year. But anyway, keep going. How much do we give? Uh, yeah, we give, it's going to be more than that when they get going. Volkswagen, too, right? <laughs> yeah. But but let's be real here. If now if, if Ottawa is really focused on trying to come up with climate change policies to improve the earth, 
then you would not be outbidding another country by $15 billion to make an EV plant. Because that project and products and solutions can obviously be done cheaper elsewhere. So Canada should be keeping that money. And my God, maybe we can improve infrastructure with it. Maybe we can improve healthcare systems or Export whatever. Export natural gas to China to get them off coal, maybe. <laughs> now, the so, Chinese, from their perspective, here's another thought. You know, we're hitting on them all the time because, you know, they're producing more emissions than anyone else. You know, the, the Chinese are. If I were them, I would turn around and say, yes, that's true. However, and, you know, we try to come up with some solution to help us. But our way to contribute to reducing global emissions is by producing the lowest cost EV products and sending them out to you guys, right? Yeah. But that's not being communicated as well. So I think some political groups out there may be a little untruthful about the real intentions with this. But the joke is one more thing, sorry, but I know Steve wants to jump in. The other thing is, but the, the US, I know there's NAFTA and there's blah, blah, all these things. There's a free trade agreement with the US, which is murky. And certainly I don't know enough about it. But the U.S. could just put tariffs on Canadian batteries. Uh, like, you know, why, why not? If we're and under the and the proviso that we are illegally subsidizing an industry or what? I mean, it, it's not guaranteed at all that the $15 billion will produce a sufficient jobs or return on that investment. Or And then what if in five years someone creates... A technology that completely make that like you know obviates the need for electric vehicles altogether. I mean, it's just a, it's just such a farce. But anyway, yeah. So Chinese firms uh, now supply three quarters of the world's solar panels. So U.S. companies twenty years ago they made about twenty two percent of them. Uh, they now produce just one percent on American soil. Um, so their reaction is to ramp up tariffs. And um, yeah, I mean, it's, I mean, it feels kind of like this protectionist policy. I mean, is that kind of where we're going away from this? I mean, it's a bit of a bold statement to say deglobalization, but clearly I think the global economy is coming more and more fract fractured and, and protectionist. Of course. And, and that, I mean, nationalization is, that's the way the pendulum is swinging back because you know, globalization is dead rich. <laughs> globalists around the world are doing everything they desperately can to try to keep all of this together. Law Schwab. <laughs> but think about that 15 billion for one more second. I mean, they could have like allocated that to uh was it G global strategies, GS strategies, what are they called? <laughs> What's the name of the firm? GC strategy, isn't it? GC, they could have and they could have hired 15 people and created 15 new billionaires in Canada and then tax them at the highest rate. That's a win for everyone. There are so many things you could do with that money. I think well, it, it just as an investment takeaway from this, is, I'm sure our political hot takes are great, but I think that the real economic takeaway is that a lot of these policies are just simply inflationary. And I think that that's, I think that that's, sort of um that's the underlying takeaway from all of these environmental whether it's subsidizing companies that shouldn't be building things in wrong areas because they're way too expensive or not viable otherwise whether it's tariffs um do you know what i mean like on on particular products that otherwise shouldn't be built in these different regions i mean it, it's just amazing and I, I will just quote you what joe biden said in 2019 he thinks that t trump doesn't get the basics he thinks his tariffs are being paid by china any freshman econ, econ student could tell you that american people are going to pay his tariffs and i that's a direct quote from joe biden in 2019 so i just think it's important to just keep, keep that in mind what that basically means is that it's just going to be inflationary you're going to higher costs for for products and and we're going to pay for it yeah, well, speaking of jobs, uh, we had the Canada jobs numbers that came out this week. The random number generator strikes again. Um, Keith, we had a big jump. It was, what, 90,000 90, new jobs? Um, I, I think it. I think the bulk of those being in the public sector. But anyways, it was a number that beat. Um, so, you know, we had... I think if you unpack it, Rich, the, the numbers weren't as great as maybe the headline suggested, but the, at the end of the day, they still beat. And uh, I think it pulled rate hike or uh, rate cut odds from the BOC lower. So uh, I don't know if you want to unpack that a bit further. Yeah. I mean, it's just, um, I think it, in general, it, it, the employment increase was 90,000. 
Um, so that's good. I think the problem I think people would say is that the gains in April were driven by part-time employment, um, which was an increase of 50,000. In general, again, broad strokes, full-time employment is more productive and higher paying than part-time employment. I think people intuitively understand that. Um, I think, you know, that, that's, that, that's, yeah, that's really important. The other thing is um, the employment rate continues, well, it held steady, but is trending lower. So remember, we're importing lots and lots of people, but we aren't necessarily finding appropriate work for those people. As Carolyn Rogers articulated, there's a, a mismatch um, by a, in sector employment, whatever. And so our employment rate is now basically holding steady around 61. It peaked at like 62 in, in a bit. I know it doesn't, those numbers don't sound big, but when it comes to those employment numbers, little de like little decimal points or you know 100 basis points or whatever make a huge difference. The other thing is that the unemployment rate is trending higher. Yes, it was steady, but is trending higher. And I think that it's um, it sort of speaks to the issues that we're having. Are are the are we getting the right mix of people coming in? Yes or no? Uh, and, and incidentally, for you, Steve, construction sector lost ten thousand jobs over the month. I know it's very volatile, but I just thought that was kind of a cute. I little mean, that wrinkle. feels like it's just getting started um, from like an anecdotal perspective. Um, but over the last year, the public sector in Canada has gained two hundred eight thousand jobs. Uh, against 190,000 new private sector jobs. So over the last year, public sector has uh, has added more jobs in the private sector. Which should I'm sure I'm sure that's affecting productivity somewhere along the lines. It's a mystery. Uh, it's a mystery, yeah. And I know people get very upset with that comment, but again, productivity is not how hard somebody works in a job, it's what it's producing for the total economy. Uh, so a couple of things that me that jumped out, I mean, I love how Steve, you refer to it as the random number generator, I think, you know, the number that comes out. And the reason we say that, because the actual number, it's never in line with what estimates are. It's It can be revised away three months later or at the end of the year, the whole year it gets revised away. But to give you an idea, so 90,000 jobs created in Canada for one month. You know, for all those being equal, you know, that's equivalent to about 900,000 jobs for the American economy. And if the U.S. economy announced they just created 900,000 new jobs, what would happen to markets then, Steve? They'd, Rich? They'd rip. They would, I don't know. Well, I think they'd actually fall because there well, would be rate yeah. hikes priced in. And oh, <laughs> yeah. The, yeah. <laughs> It, it's got to do something to someone out there, right? Uh, so it is a pretty big number. And I, I think breaking it down towards, you know, private sector versus government, full-time, part-time, that that's really important. Uh, the other number that I really, uh, that I look at really, because remember all of the objective of looking at the jobs data is try to figure out what the Bank of Canada is going to do. And we probably have like the most important Bank of Canada meeting in our lifetime coming up next <laughs> month. You know, that's just the way it's lined up. Cut, right baby, now. cut. Yeah, we're, well, we'll have someone's going to be eating a Twinkie, I think. They're not cutting. The <laughs> it's going to be done already. Porter. Yeah, it could be. Um, wouldn't that be great to see a banker eat a Twinkie on the show? <laughs> yeah, we do have, that's a spoiler. We do have Doug Porter, uh, chief economist at BMO. He's coming on the show. Uh, the week before the BOC is expected to cut or not cut. Uh, so we'll we'll get dug in for the Twinkie bet. Speaking of cut, because we are living in the world of technology, we should get, uh, before we have Doug come online, we'll get two clips of him, one eating a Twinkie and one without, <laughs> and then we can put it on afterwards. Uh, but back to even less more important <laughs> perspectives here. The hourly wage rate uh, for permanent employees uh, th this is key. It, it actually increased. Uh, you know, it, it's a bit less than the previous month, a bit stronger, but really wages are still increasing almost at a 5% level on an annualized basis. And if you want to control inflation in your economy, you have to control wage growth. And I know some people are thinking, well, no, I need more wages, you know, so I can combat, you know, higher prices, you know, pay for groceries and everything. But if wages are still increasing at, again, 5% rate, yeah, that's that's strong. Um, inflation will remain sticky as well. So, I, I, you know, obviously uh, the June meeting for the Bank of Canada, it's going to be a live one, boys. And I haven't decided yet which way they're going to go. But it seems like you two are both, I think Rich is, sorry, Steve is leaning towards a cut. Rich is no cut for you. 
and uh, we'll, we'll as we get closer, we'll figure. Well, I think it out. we have Canada's CPI data. Is it next week? Uh, yeah, it's on the twenty first. It's, always, the it's 21st. a week after the U.S. Normally, yeah. So I mean, that will be. I guess that's probably the. Oh wait, is that the last reading for TIFF? I think so. It is makes a decision. Yeah. So I mean, that will be certainly one to watch. But Rich, what are the? Do you have the rate cut odds right now? Like, what are they kind of do. slowed down? I do. I pulled to? it up. I pulled it up ahead of time, and now I've lost it. <laughs> <laughs> Give me one side. I did, I did have it. So, uh, three, oh, I'm going to get in trouble two, now. One. Uh, the radar. Okay. So for who? The US or Canada? Canada. So I need to close my window. Um, Take your time here. We'll just insert <laughs> uh, an advertisement. <laughs> okay. Sorry for someone's mowing lawn. That's that's great. Good podcast. But for everyone who like who's watching the podcast, not watching the podcast, when I just heard then, because I was looking at my screen, I heard a Rich say, I got to close my window. I thought he was talking about one of his windows on his computer screen <laughs> it was physically the window in your house right that's yeah. where you went yeah all what right so here we go what, what's okay. the question again <laughs> what are the rate cut odds right now for boc june okay so june is ooh 50 percent. wow wow coin toss that's, that's, yeah coin toss 50 50 minus 48.9 so basically a 50 percent uh chance of a hike slash cut 47.7. Jesus, it's moving down as, as we talk about. Maybe someone's got the live feed of the Looney Hour. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and that's for June the 5th, guys. So yes, sir. a couple more weeks, right, before we get there. Rich, yeah. what's the uh, first cut from the Fed? The Fed is 10% in well, from June 6th. Yeah, but the first cut is priced in for what? September? Oh, excuse me. Sorry, September. That's right. Oh, no, it's 50%. No, it's 54.5% it's for September. So, yeah, I mean, you know. So if Basically, the Canadians do cut in a couple of weeks and the Americans don't cut and, the, you know, the, the data still suggests that they can see sticky, uh, you know, that, that all those being equal, it should be a pretty big market mover coming up. Yeah. Yeah. Keith, so what do about you think that Canada will move without the U.S.? They're not going to be aligned perfectly. So... Yes, they can move before the U.S., but I'm again. It's just me thinking, and I'm really smart. But <laughs> I would imagine all of the major central banks are, you know, they're speaking with the Fed, and you know, the Fed's not going to say, "Yeah, we're definitely going to cut," because then it's it's out there immediately. But I think they, for the Canadians to start cutting before the Americans are cutting. They will tell you, no, they do it independently. But I think they would feel very comfortable that, yeah, the Americans are, are on the way to cutting. So therefore, if I'm Canada right now, I'm the three of us for the Bank of Canada. And we, you know, I'm the deciding vote because, you know, you two guys are can't agree on what to do. Uh, I wouldn't cut in June. I would say, hey, let's let, let's wait for the Americans, you know, to, to come on board. Because the danger is that, you know, we do cut. And something else happens, the Americans, they, they don't cut, and the Canadian dollar gets hit hard. And then inflation data gets, gets a bit more skewed again, and the economy could come off a bit. And, you know, it, it could create a, a spiral that we clearly don't want. That's just me. I, I would wait in, in line for the Americans. Hey, so speaking of uh, other central banks, I uh, wanted to keep an eye on was the uh, Aussie. The Aussie Central Bank uh, was out last week saying that interest rates were at the right level after holding them for a uh, sixth consecutive month. But they cautioned that inflation risks uh, were on the upside and a sign that policy was unlikely to be eased anytime soon. Um, so keep in mind, this is a Australia, what I would argue is, is a highly, it's even more levered housing market than here in Canada. And they have a larger proportion of their mortgages that are sitting on variable rate mortgages as well. So um, I, I would imagine that's a country even more desperate for rate cuts than than Canada. Yeah, it's interesting because the RBNZ, so the um, the Reserve Bank of New Zealand, sort of came out with a different view. So they're having the similar sort of population stuff, although their house prices have come off quite a bit. Um, they've been more sort of hawkish because they're having difficulties with equity flows and people selling their down their debt and. Um, their equity market is very expensive and um, there's a bunch of problems, but they sort of came out and those two countries are sort of very, very linked and they're obviously linked to China as well. Maybe we'll talk about market stuff in a bit, but 
it's interesting how you know we've talked about a lot of the global synchronized the global synchronization and and I understand these central banks talk to each other, but I think we're starting to see that fray at the edges a little bit, where you had Switzerland cut, the Bank of Japan raised rates, RBNZ is being hawkish, RBA is being dovish. Um, the U, I think the ECB is going to cut by the summer because they can. Um, Canada, I don't think they can. Uh, so it's interesting to see how this is all. And then we know that the Latin American countries have started to cut months and months ago. Mexico cut, Brazil um, although you got Indonesia raising rates. So it's actually fascinating how this we're really, really fraying at the edges as far as that policy synchronization. You know, this I just saw comes... an article. Go ahead. Uh, sorry, see, I, I just saw an article here. Um, you know, TD is actually asking the exact same question that we, we were just asking each other. You know, will the Bank of Canada cut without the Fed cutting? Or will they, you know, become desynchronized, I guess is the word that you're describing, Rich. So everyone's talking about it now, and it, it could be a, a big deal. And But it's only a big deal if, you know, someone's economy, you know, gets sort of out, out of sorts here with it. And we're not at that point yet, of course, but we are seeing some interesting reactions. Uh, I think China this week, didn't they announce an enormous program to buy houses, Steve? Did you see that announcement yeah. in China? I, I saw that. I, I read it briefly. I mean, obviously, I don't know the exact details of the policy, but in, in essence, it sounded like there's this you know huge supply glut uh, in China, and so the government apparently has proposed. They're they're putting a proposal sort of in place. It's not a passed yet, but they're they're going to basically buy uh, unsold inventory off of the developers uh, at a and obviously at a discounted price. Uh, and then they're going to convert it to long-term affordable housing. So um, I don't know. We'll see. I mean, that's the Chinese real estate bubble. Hard to burst when you've got the government coming in and. But what that does, I mean, it, it bail, but it bails out the builders, of course. Yeah. Because it gets an unperforming asset off their balance sheet and they get received cash for it, I, I guess. If you want to call the wand cash, I wouldn't, but Rich <laughs> come <might>. on. <laughs> <laughs> but then you still have the supply of houses out there. So walk, walk me through this. The supply of houses are still there. Is it they weren't sold because the price was too high or there was no demand for it in general? Because now all of a sudden the builders are flush with you know cash again. They can start building again if they wanted to. How does it really resolve the problem? And of course, you know, the, the government itself, they just simply took the bad debt, you know, from the private sector onto the public sector balance sheet. I, I don't know what uh, this... We I don't know. We need a Chinese realtor on the pod. Let's get I mean, that I think, lady I think from it... the Japanese Honda company to translate and how it works. <laughs> I think I think it's about a, it's a signal. I can't, I can't speak to why you'd want to recapitalize the home builders. Which in, I mean, the property index, um, if you look online, is down something like eighty percent. So the equity index for property developers in China is 80, 90 percent, depending on. And the bonds for many of these companies have gone to zero, and we know some developers have gone to zero. But I think it might be about, and this is I'm speculating here, but it might be about sort of arresting the price declines. So, and if you arrest those price declines, it might change people's view um, on how they consume and what they consume. So. You know, for China, just like in America in 2008 and seven, whatever, in Canada, before this last little wrinkle, you know, people's the wealth effect was really important. And if your largest asset, whether it's, you know, you live there or whether it's investment is related to um, housing, if those house prices are falling, then you'll be more reluctant to spend your consumer confidence will go down, you might get a little antsy about who's running your country, etc. And I think by buying those houses, and you can stem that decline right or wrong, I think it helps um, with a bunch of those wealth effect issues, consumer confidence, and then willing to spend in other sort of areas. So that, that would be my, 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 you know, my my uh, idea on that. I think also what's worth noting is that the Hang Seng, which is um, the main Chinese index, and as well as the CSI, uh, are up 30% from the January lows. So it's, it's you know, I think as China sort of tries to get themselves out of this housing bust and sort of take, as you said, Keith, take on the debt that was either in the banking sector or, you know, was in these, you know, pockets where it's basically with zero, but they're assuming that debt. 
it sort of allows the economy to to take to move forward. And we've seen that happen before, whether it was in Ireland and Spain, um, in the US, you know, the government sort of steps in as lender of last resort, floats the, the, the these assets again, right or wrong, um, and then allows sort of the economy to move forward. Um, we'll see what happens next. But the equity market seems to be happy with it. I mean, a couple of points with that, though. So first of all, you know, we all have an opinion on whether it's right or wrong. And the response to having a view on it is always, it's irrelevant. Right. right? You That's should why never I mentioned say, the equity market. Yeah. yeah, you should never say, hey, a government should do this or they shouldn't do that. You have to understand what are they going to do? In this case, clearly, you know, the Chinese government are going to bail out, you know, bad debt. Uh, but it, it also then you have to appreciate, okay, what effect does it have on the economy longer term? So what's happening in this case, I mean, the same thing in, in Canada as well, like when it happens, is that, um, <laughs> <laughs> but, um, you know, you, you're you bailing out bad decision makers. So somebody who did, they made an economic decision and it didn't work out well, well for them. They have a loss. What you now you're doing, you're rewarding that person, that individual, the family, or the company, or the builder in this situation. You're rewarding them for bad economic behavior, and that that's not how you create you know, a healthy economy long term. You, you need, it's cyclical. You're going to have some periods where it's a boom and you do well, and then there's a bust and you don't do well. But you need that to flush the system out. All that this this does it merely you know it, it'll put a bit of a pause on everything coming up. And as an individual, of course, you would look at this and, and say, man, if I just bought a house and it got chopped in value by 50%, or if you're a developer and you say you put 500 grand of your own money and you levered it up 10 times or something like that, and you know it's not working, you want to get bailed out. Of course you do, right? You want to get your money. But th th ha there has to be uh, checks in this system, like implicit checks that will reward good economic behavior or smart decisions and then if you make a bad decision you, you don't get rewarded by it so this this chinese move um you know i i just it's just one move after another that they continue to do which still which continues to signal to us that you know the problem in china has not been resolved at all the debt is still there they're just moving it from one part of the room you know to the other they should open up that Chinese market to, to Canadians. They love uh, speculating <laughs> on pre-condos. That'll soap Dude, up the excess supply pretty quick. Not investment advice. <laughs> <laughs> open it up. Wouldn't um, it be funny, though, if all the capital flow in Vancouver started going into China? They say, hey, you know what? It's better to live over there. You know, there's better value and everything. Yeah, take your money back. Maybe. Mm -hmm. um, Rich, we also had US CPI. U.S. retail data came in soft. I mean, like I said, I'm a bit surprised that the uh, the Fed rate cut odds uh, haven't really, I guess they haven't really shifted a whole lot since, but U.S. CPI came in softer than expected. I mean, it's still obviously elevated. It's still nothing to celebrate and cheer about, but uh, you also had U.S. retail sales. I'm not sure how much you're pulling away from that. The retail sales I missed. I was too busy um, on that. But the inflation You're stuff. Watching I did... all the fox eyes. <laughs> um, but the inflation stuff. I mean, yeah, like inflation is still above target. I think that's important. I think what people were really looking for, looking at, were services, services x shelter. Now that we've taken away all the pieces that are rising, we're looking at only the things that are going down. No, I'm kidding. Um, you know, it was still 0.3 on on the month, with which at an annualized pace is still above target. Um, the stuff I like to look at is services um, and goods. So goods is basically still, you know, pinned to basically zero. And services CPI in the US is still above 5%. Um, partly that's due to shelter. But even if you exclude shelter, it's at 4.87% year on year. So that's still... You know, it's still, I think, way too high for them. I think, um, you know, you do have some, some, you know, hand wringing over sort of the rental component in that, which is starting to come down. But at the same time, you're having the energy uh, piece rise year on year. And so I, I still don't think we're out of the woods yet. I don't know if that'll change uh, Jay Powell's view on whether or not they want to cut. It seems like they've, they're have they sort of pre-committed to that. Um, but yeah, it's, I think it was sort of almost like a non, it was weird how it, a month ago, that was like the most important data point that came out. And then this week, it seemed like a damp squib. So who knows? 
Is it a damp a damp squid or a squib? A squib the... with a B. <laughs> what is that? What is a squib? We we talked about this before. A squib is when you're like it's the thing you put in the stick of dynamite. It's, okay. It's, it's the thing that, that lights. That makes a lot more sense than a damp squid. I get it now. I never knew oh, that before. Yeah, it's like, you know, if you're one of those like frogmen who, you know, who's like all painted in different colors and with the your night vision goggles and you want to blow up a bridge. And then you have to put the squib in the thick of dynamite. And then you anyways. <laughs> Damn squids. <laughs> and he's wearing binoculars at the same time <laughs> right. and everything. Yeah. Isn't that great? Hey, you know, like, you know, we're world-class money managers. You know, right. instead of instead of getting involved with the CPI discussion, I'm more interested in in the in the squid game. Well, it's indicative of how like it wasn't the market didn't move. I don't know, Keith, am I wrong about that? I feel like the market didn't really move on the data. Uh yeah, I mean, there's always an initial burst and then people calm down. But think let's think about the inflation print this way. You know, not too recently, the number was about 6% plus, right? Yeah. And we're going from six down to five and a half, down to four, eight. And now it, it seems to me that, you know, all of the gains or the slowdown in growth, because remember, that's what it is. Prices are still rising. Like, let's, let's not be stupid about it here. Um, I can, can it go a lot lower? I don't, I mean, obviously there's a mathematical aspect to it and the way it's calculated and the time range and everything. But it seems to me like all of the easy improvements in the inflation stories, uh, maybe we've already experienced 90% of them. And, you know, maybe the the new 2% is 3% because they're still at three and a half. Yep. Right. So 2% is still a long ways to go. And I think the only way they can get there is if they have a real hard landing in the economy. And I don't think that's looking like that's about to happen in the next couple of months anyway. So this, you know, it, the number is what it is. So at the same time, though, uh, the retail sales number, like they were, they were, they were kind of weakish as well. So the reason equities are doing really well now is because, you know, the inflation numbers are improving. The growth data is slowing a bit and with, with retail sales that came out of the Americans on, on the same day, which then goes back to this whole Fed story. You know, everyone's waiting for the Fed to cut rates. Everyone's waiting for Carolyn Rogers to cut rates. Because we all know she makes the decision, right, Rich? It's not the other guy. That's it's right. Her. Well, this, well yeah. let me just let me just jump in there because I think that there's actually some weakness on the U.S. employment side that I think is worth talking about. So the U.S. last month, the U.S. data, the employment data, non-farm payrolls, which comes out of the first Friday of every month, came out weaker than expected. But then we're also also starting to see some like some just general weakness in the U.S. employment. That I think is worth flagging. I mean, um, you know, we look. There's th things called temporary help services, which is a really, really important data point that people look at. So it makes sense. You, you'd first you'd fire. You wouldn't hire temporary help before you get rid of your part time employment. Remember that from Canada. And then there's the full time employment. But there's also indicators called. There's one indicator that relates to recession. But I I don't want to I don't want to harp on the recession piece. I want to think about sort of what's happening in the labor market. And there's something called the SOM indicator S A H M, and it's the SOM rule. And it sort of compares sort of the the uh, the, the relative to minimum of three month averages of unemployment. Um, and then you compare that to twelve month unemployment. Is this SOM or uh, SAM? Sam, Sam, I don't know. I don't know. I, I think you're making this up now. No, I've no, never you... Sam <laughs> report before. It's, no, no, it's cool. And it's a, what it is, is it's basically trying to see the momentum in your employment or unemployment. Um, the other thing that I wanted to point out was- Is it a the... diffusion indicator or an outright <laughs> no. number? No? It's an out, it's, 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 it's one number divided by another number, which- you know, I, I know it's difficult for Dabbling you. Babbling turds. It, it's right. But the other thing is is something <laughs> called um, underemployment. Um, so that usually when you when people talk about unemployment, it's the number of people um, like in, uh, looking or unemployed, not employed relative to the labor force. But there's something called underemployment to so people who are working in jobs that are, quote, and, you know, inverted commas, lower than their station. If you're a physicist and you're working at um, you know, working as a real estate broker, that's maybe a misallocation of, of labor capital, uh, but the underemployment is Rich, starting to rise. <laughs> Steve, Steve didn't even, Steve didn't even believe with that Steve one. He's, think. Steve's getting bored right now. He's like, Jesus, come on, let's wrap let's it up. Move along. It's important. Anyways, no, there you go. I'm more interested in, um, 
What's the and all the meme stocks that are back? Oh yeah. Whoa, Game guys? Boy. Game Boy. No, it's GameStop. <laughs> what's that what's that guy's name again? The kitty? I can't remember. I don't the know. kitty cat. Kitty cat playing Game Boy. No, I, I watched the movie. It was on Netflix. It was good. He's back. He's apparently tweeted for the first time in a couple of years. GameStop ripped. AMC ripped. How is that legal? Keith, how is that legal? Is that not he like likes the um, stock. pumping and dumping or whatever? He likes the stock. Keith's doing a trade. But there's, but there's more market no, stuff. He's I, think. He's, he, I don't even know the ticker for this thing. So GME. Uh, oh, no, we're going to get in trouble now. Shit, I should have said that. Oh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Uh, edit cut cut <laughs> er, but the uh <laughs> so i mean <laughs> yeah this is not investment <laughs> advice in any way whatsoever so so this this pos that stands for piece of shit by the way in, <laughs> yeah in you know it's trading at like 10 to 15 bucks and then it obviously gets ramped up higher to almost 50 some poor sucker out there starts buying it. He might have five grand saved up or, or something. He pays 40 or 50 bucks for it. Now, today, it's down to 30 bucks again. How, how like that a legal? good buying reason opportunity for, to me. And your, your reason for buying it was because some animated person? Cat. <laughs> is it a cat? What is it? Yeah, that's no, he's real. It's a, it's a real person. His name is like I, his, his Reddit name or whatever. His YouTube name is... I don't know. Some one of our fans has commented by. Oh, of course. And, and by the way, everyone listening, yeah, like I actually, I am fond of it. I'm, I'm just letting on a little bit here, but you know, that's not investing. That's something that's interesting. So we, you know, we but, talk about allocating risk all the time. I wouldn't allocate any of my risk bucket to it, but some people do. <laughs> and, you know, just be mindful. That's a ma- ma- understatement of the century. But Keith, I have a genuine question. Like, we have to be so careful. Like, I m- misspoke. I should not have said the ticker. So please, Frank, don't get me in trouble. But like, we have to be so careful. You have to be careful. I mean, you know, Steve, in his capacity, has to be very careful what he says and sa- doesn't say. How is, do you know, like, how this person is not, in jail for like doing this and like why there isn't more scrutiny on him i know this is sort of out of our our regular looney hour scheduled programming but i'm just really curious how this is allowed to to carry to carry on yeah I, I don't know i mean there's there's a lot of regulators have Biden, a lot of he's fighting for the people to follow yeah he's <laughs> fighting for the people it it's against tough... wall street baby but, the, but it's a real big industry out there guys and like you know regulars work hard at what they're doing and you know, I I think it you could it should attract interest, of course, but um, you know, it is what it is today. And that's right. that's what can be done. All right, let's sign off. I'd go buy some call options on these. <laughs> no, <laughs> levered, levered. Uh, I think that's uh, I think that's a good place to uh, to wrap it up here. As always, do your own financial due diligence uh, before investing a loony in these markets, uh, and we appreciate you guys' support. And we'll see you next week.